never been a more abundant time ever in human civilization. Yet we are no happier now than we were in the 1950s. Hey folks, this is Mark Devine with the Unbeatable Mind Podcast. Thanks so much for your attention today. I appreciate you coming back to listen to what we have to say. I've got a fantastic guest today, Neil Pashricha. We're going to talk about happiness and being awesome and all sorts of really cool things. Um, And, you know, how to get back up when you fall down. Fall down seven times, get up eight. You've heard me say that before. Before I get started, you know, let me take care of the usual stuff. Uh, First, Our podcast is available at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, so whatever your, you know, technology du jour is there. Um, And I just want to remind you, it really, really, really helps if you rate the podcast. And if you really, really like what we're doing, then, you know, give it five stars. Just start at the right side, click there, and then you're done. Uh, And that helps other people who are like-minded find the podcast, which keeps it, you know, relevant, and I get more, more and better guests. All right. So thanks for that. The other thing I wanted to say is, you know, I'm very proud of the Unbeatable Mind philosophy training model, our certified coaches. And it all started with the uh, foundation course, which I developed in 2011. This came out of my work, my deep work with SEAL and special ops candidates in our 30-day Warrior Monk Academies. Now, I often tell this story to my, you know, my trainees that I had 30 days and I was the head coach and we were training for 15 hours a day. And so it was fairly easy for me to come up with a whole seal fit training model and teach them how to, you know, use uh, physical exercise and movement to be, you know, physically and mentally tough. But what, you know, then that filled up maybe seven of the hours. So what was I going to do with the other eight hours? And so uh, over time, I developed the whole unbeatable, unbeatable mind curriculum, which was to literally train the mental, emotional, intuitional and Kokoro or whole mind aspects of the operators, that training proved to be so effective that the SEALs were getting through BUDS or SEAL training 90% of the time compared to 85% fail rate for everybody else. And a lot of individuals, some of you who may be listening, uh, took notice and started asking, hey, can I do that? Uh, I don't want to come through your 50-hour Kokoro camp and get my ass kicked, but I do want to learn those techniques. And so I built the online course called the Unbeatable Mind Foundations, of course. At any rate, the reason I'm telling you that is I just spent 18 months rebuilding the entire thing. All new content, written content. I literally wrote an entire book for it. It's all online. It's not available elsewhere. And uh, all new training videos, practices, So it's and a brand new platform. It's very, very good. And um, I encourage you to check it out if you haven't. It's not a quick fix. It's not a hack. It's not a short course. It's 12 months long. You can do it over 12 months or you can uh, enroll in the whole, you know, basically purchase the whole thing up front and work your way through it at your own pace. It is a total life transformation, guaranteed. All right, enough on that. Unbeatablemind.com. Check it out. Unbeatablemind.com slash monthly if you want to look at the monthly training. All right. Neil Pashricha from... Canada, uh, Harvard MBA, founder of the Institute for Global Happiness. Isn't that cool? I mean, who knew there was an Institute for Global Happiness? Uh, One of the most popular TED Talks. So after this, if you're inspired to um, see him in action, go just search for Neil on TED. And um, gosh, got to start working at Walmart. How interesting. Never thought of that as a happy place, Neil. Welcome to <laughs> welcome to Unbeal Mind. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. So, how did you? You know, was Walmart like the happiest place you ever worked, Neil? Or <laughs> what's the link there? Well, the link there was actually, you know, you mentioned. Uh, so, first of all, thank you for having me, Mark. I appreciate being on. Yeah. The show. Oh, it's awesome. My and you know, it's it's really like advice I got when I was at Harvard. Pr- frankly, I mm-hmm. I I was in my first couple weeks uh, at school and. I was lucky enough to have lunch with the dean. Why? Because I got like this financial aid thing. And so I had I had this lunch with the, the old dean of Harvard. And so mm. I go in, it's like this kind of older, kind of like 80-year-old guy. And he sits me down. We have a tuna sandwich. And he's like, how's it going? And I'm like, <laughs> not good. I'm like, it's really not good. I'm, he's like, why? I'm like, I'm stressed. It's like I'm working every night till late just on preparing for class. And of course, even though it's September, 
all the big fancy companies are already here, like McKinsey and Google and and Goldman Sachs. And they're all these millionaire bankers with black bags under their eyes. And we're all lining up to kind of be just like them. We want to be millionaire bankers with black bags under our eyes too. So every night we're like hobnobbing. We're going out for beers. We're going out for drinks. We're going out for like lunches and case interviews and like second round interviews and all these like researching all this stuff. It's like, it's really exhausting. And, and that was like, all the uh, first year. That was, was like your first year. year. Yeah. My Holy first year God. at Harvard Business School. Yeah. It was a two year <laughs> program. So, um, I, you know what he says to me? He's like, well, get off the beach. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, he's like, well, you're, you're like standing at the edge of the beach. You, you got this fence in front of you and, and on the beach are like 10 bathing beauties. You're like, you're like, you can't wait to like run out on that beach. The problem <laughs> is, and the problem is there's a thousand people just like you waiting for the beach to open. Right. And so in this metaphor, he's telling me, of course, the bathing beauties are like McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, you know, like mm-hmm. the, the, this super cool job at the super cool company. He's like, the problem is your odds of landing a bathing beauty are, are extremely small. And not only that, but even if you land one, what are you going to be doing? You're just going to be looking over your shoulder the whole time. You're going to be thinking someone's going to steal this job from you. Someone's going to steal yeah. this this kind of amazing thing you got. You won't even feel special. So yeah, like, and furthermore, oh, those ba- those bathing beauties aren't all they're cracked up to be. <laughs> well, there you right. go. And then so I'm like, I'm like, well, what do I do? And he's like, get off the beach. I'm like, what do you mean get off the beach? He's like, he's like, go find the broken company, the, the down on the lock company, the, the bankrupt company, the people wrestling with something, the ones that don't have money to fly a mm. team of recruiters in a private jet to Harvard. They're trying to, they're trying to stay alive. And so if mm. you approach them, if you knock on their door, they'll be a little bit surprised to see you. But if you come in, if you come in their house, they're delighted when you start talking. They want your opinion mm. in meetings. They're willing to promote you to to jobs of uh, wider kind of leadership opportunity. You'll you'll get like more chances there. You'll learn more there. You'll be a better person there. And so it's weird. But I came home. I never went to another job or recruiting session at Harvard Business School campus ever again. Literally after that that, that lunch, I made a wow. spreadsheet of a hundred companies that I was intrigued by, but which for whatever reason did not recruit at Harvard. So I was like. I was like, maybe they had a big oil spill or maybe they had like, you know, nobody thought that that uh, nobody wanted to work at Walmart because like, you know, they kill small towns and they, you know, they they don't pay anyone anything, all this bad reputation. So I knock on their door. I knock on 100 companies doors. Okay, like what I say is I not when I say that I mean hundred cold. You didn't call. actually walk up and knock. <laughs> no, I did not Hello. fly to Bentonville, Arkansas, and knock on like a, the head office door. I but I sent a hundred like cold calls. I got like fifty responses. I got like twenty five phone calls. I got like ten first round interviews, which they would have called like a coffee or a lunch, and I called in my head like I got to impress them. And I got like five job offers, and so I accepted Walmart because in my mind, Mark, they had the most people in the whole world, two point five million employees. And therefore, the most leaders. And what I was interested in is developing leaders. That's yeah. what I did. I was director of leadership development there. And um, sure straight, enough, I, straight out. You're, you mean the first no, job you got there? No, that was my last job there. I was the manager okay. of leadership development when I got there. I started as a manager, and then um, I did a couple other roles in human resources, uh, running up learning and development. And then I went to go work for uh, a CEO inside the company as his like assistant or chief of staff, writing speeches and, and traveling with him and so on. I nice. did that for four years for two CEOs there. And then I came back out and I was director of leadership development. So I was director of leadership development for like my last two of the 10 years. Mm-hmm. And um, you asked me at the beginning, why Walmart? And I said, right. now I'm saying, I'm telling you why. It's this adage that like you got to find a smaller pond to be a mm-hmm. bigger fish. Yeah. Don't chase the beauty at the beach, but rather find a, a pond you can win in. And I'm not just saying – that because Walmart was a place where they took me seriously uh, and I was like able to like come into my own there. They, they gave me a lot of development, a lot of opportunity. I'm saying that because literally 1984, a research study comes out saying, is it better to be a bigger fish in a smaller pond? And what they found, and this study has been replicated across tons of, of countries around the world in different cultures. The answer is not only is it a huge yes, but the amazing thing is your positive academic self-concept, i.e. how you think of yourself, actually increases for 10 extra years after you leave the pond. Mm. So when you put yourself in a game that you can win, then you think you're great for a long, way longer time than you're playing, mm-hmm. right? And so I've tried to use this model. We're talking about happiness. I've tried to use it, and we're talking about resilience. We're ta- I've tried to use this model everywhere in my life, and I, I suck at Speaking is like this, like like a, a speaking agency wants to hire me after my TED talk comes out. They're like, Neil, we want you to be this much money. And I'm like, 
well, that's ridiculous. Who else speaks for that much money? It's ridiculous. They're like Olympic gold medalist, uh, New York Times bestselling authors. I'm like, oh, I heard of those people. What about half price? <laughs> Who's in that camp? And they name a whole bunch of people I never heard of before. And I'm like, well, what about half that price? Like, what about the smallest pond you got? And they're like, well, we don't even have, like, that's the smallest pond there is. You can't work on commission for less than, like, let's just say five grand. Okay, five grand for a speech. But I'm like, that's a lot of money. Put me in the smallest camp, smallest pond you got. And why did I do that, Mark? Well, because for the first year I'm speaking, I'm now speaking to, like, boardrooms. I'm speaking to, like, 20 people at an offsite. I'm yeah. not speaking to a thousand people in Vegas. And you're a rock star. Right. Yeah. And you're so developing have, your confidence. Exactly. And so. Right. That's a really long way of saying why I went to over Walmart. It was a great company. They treated me super well. I loved it being there. And then I left to be an author full time two years ago. So, it, okay. So you wrote a book called The Happiness Equation. So I know a lot of your research and you know a lot of your thinking is around positive mindset and happiness. Was Walmart a positive place to work? Well, here's the thing. Uh, that book you just mentioned, The Happy Equation, was my fifth book. My okay. first book was The Book of Awesome. And I right. wrote that eight years before I left Walmart. So I was at Walmart eight okay. years after that book came out. My wife uh, and I uh, sadly had a divorce. She, 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 mm. It was her call um, and she wasn't feeling it. And she was courageous enough to tell me openly about it, which is mm -hmm. an honorable thing to do if you're not feeling like you should be in a marriage. Mm -hmm. And at the same time that happened, I lost my best friend from a suicide. Mm. And so oh, I started hard. blogging uh, on a blog called 1000awesomethings.com every single okay. day for a thousand straight weekdays. I wrote about simple, trite, simple things like, you know, getting called up to the dinner buffet first at a wedding or <laughs> wearing warm <laughs> underwear from just out of the dryer, right? Or, or like, you know, if all your socks can match up out of the, you know, when you pull them out of the, out of the laundry, like you actually don't yeah. lose a sock or, oh, you know, God. pulling $5 out of your old coat pocket, playing on old dangerous <laughs> playground equipment. Anyway, I wrote a thousand of these essays. The blog went viral. It won best blog in the world twice from the International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences, hit 50 million readers, turned into wow. a book called The Book of Awesome. That sold a million copies, was on the bestseller list for 200 weeks, spawned three sequels, a kid's book, five calendars, two journals. I'm at Walmart this whole time, by the way. Right. The TED Talks, all this stuff. And then, and only then to answer your question, um, did, I, did I sort of take a step back you know, was was starkly single during all of this, like like lost weight, was really stressed, was not sleeping, was mm -hmm. in a bachelor apartment, living by myself for the first time. Yet, ironically, I had become this sort of international sport. Like I'm on the Today Show, and Meredith Vieira is like, how does the whole world learn to be happy? And I'm like, oh, scr oh crap. Like I'm, my friends would tell you I'm depressed. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but I've become this spoke because the blog oh, got wait, popular. Being awesome doesn't necessarily mean being happy then. Well, not – I wasn't awesome. I'm blogging about this stuff to teach myself it, right? That's what we're all right. doing. That's right. the secret of the whole self-help industry. It's like the thing that people are writing about is the thing they're trying to learn, right? Yeah, so I, I agree with that. So I'm like trying to write this stuff to – like my dad was an immigrant. He was like, life's really good. You got it good. You got it lucky, man. And I'm like, no, I'm, I've lost 40 pounds due to stress. I've got black bags under my eyes. My wife just left me. I lost my best friend. I have six contacts on my phone, and I have nowhere to live. That's how mm -hmm. I felt. So the blog was my medicine, and because it got popular, I was then forced through all these questions, like the one you're asking me, to say like, okay, happiness? Let's take a stab at that now. That's the bigger question. That's the 2,000-year-old Aristotle kind of like yeah. goal of life. you know. Mm -hmm. So my attempt was – to spend essentially an entire year writing a 300 page love letter to my unborn child. I oh, met cool. a new woman. We fell in love over a couple of years. And on the plane home from our honeymoon, this is my, this is my second marriage. Now she tells me she's pregnant, like on the plane, like she bought the pregnancy test in the Kuala Lumpur airport and did the pregnancy <laughs> test in the plane, in the plane bathroom. So I get home. I'm like, my world is rocking I, I again. Did. <laughs> exactly. No, she didn't get pregnant in the airplane. <laughs> she found out she was pregnant. Mark, come uh, on. I, I, the story. I'm just kidding with you. I'm uh, although, yeah, I guess it could have. No, no, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> so it's like, but, but then, so this baby is like coming. And so I write this letter, a 300 page letter to my unborn child on how to be happy. And that, that's the book you're asking me about the happiness right. equation. So was Walmart a happy place? It was for me. Uh, the, the way the way workplace always works, in my opinion, is a job is the five people you're surrounded by. And I was mm -hmm. very lucky. I had great bosses. I found the culture really inspiring. 
there's a lot of bad press about Walmart, but you honestly won't hear any from me because the 10 years I was at that company, I had great leaders. Um, I, I liked my job and so did the people around me. And so we always felt where I was working and the people I was working with that we were, we were saving people money to help them live better. It was a cost, lower yeah. the cost of living. And I always find that the people that don't like it can afford not to. Do you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. It's like, well, you yeah, know, my, my you litmus test. First, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say from my, my litmus test for like a, an organization is, uh, or the quality of life in an organization is it, the, the worse the news is, the probably better it is at the organization because the news is like completely the opposite of reality. Well, that's a good so, index. I never thought of that. I like that. Walmart is actually an extremely professional organization and they do things, you know, a certain way, of course. And I remember, I, you know, upstate New York when the Walmart was going to come into – you know, Lake Placid, New York, and there was all that gnashing of teeth. And I'm, I was thinking, well, Walmart's just basically trying to make money and they're going to employ a lot of people and they're going to provide a lot, you know, really low priced products and some local merchants aren't going to be happy. And so like 20 people will be injured and about a thousand to 5,000 will be happy. They're coming in. And of course the media trashed it. And so they never came in, but um, anyways, I don't know why I went down that rabbit hole. No, but. it's fine. I, I I think there's something to the idea that size attracts attention. Like Amazon's yeah. really, really big. And like what's on the right. front page of the newspaper, the, the poor guy's divorce. Like he's getting a divorce, yeah. like the CEO. And it's like, do you really need all these investigative journalistic reports on like the guy's marriage falling apart? Like, do you really need that? I don't know if you need that. I don't think you do. But when right. you're big, they come for you. And I remember the right. day that I think it was Sam Walton, uh, founder of Walmart, or it mm-hmm. might have been Bill Gates. I think it might have been Bill Gates. They, they told him, hey, guess what? You've officially become the richest man in the world. And he mm-hmm. replied, no good can come of that. <laughs> right. I love that. Hey, folks. Um, I've got a new, very cool health product I want to tell you about. I only uh, allow sponsors in here for products that I have used and I think are valuable. This one is called Mud water. What an interesting name, mud water. It doesn't make you want to eat it, but I tell you what, it is extremely healthy. So I don't know about you, but there's something about the morning ritual of drinking coffee that is pretty nice. But what if you could get the same effect and drink something completely healthy that's made out of all sorts of healthy materials and give you a great effect of focusing and not having the crash that comes with the coffee. So the ingredients include adaptogenic mushrooms, cacao, chai, turmeric, cinnamon, and sea salt. This product, you know, is basically just like mixing up a chai drink or something like that. It it mixes very easily with water. You can drink it hot or cold. You can use it in your smoothie if you want. It helps reduce anxiety and jitters that you get from coffee. It doesn't deplete your adrenal glands. In fact, it'll support your adrenal glands and your immune system. These guys are um, offering 50% off. That's extremely generous. 50% off for Unbeatable Mind podcast listeners. So check them out at mudwtr.com. So it sounds like water, but it's missing the A and the E. Mudwtr.com. And use the code LION, L-I-O-N, when you check out. So I love their tagline. They said, we're not mad at coffee, just disappointed. <laughs> We're not mad at coffee, just disappointed. And yes, I still drink coffee, but I also will drink the mud. So that's another approach too. All right, check it out. Mudwater.com, mudwtr.com, 50% off for you. And use the code L-I-O-N, lion. And drink it and roar. Hoo-yah. Thank you. So you just uh, alluded to one of my questions. You have a bunch of bench tests for decision making that you allude to in your happiness book. And one of them is the five people test. And so are you alluding to the fact that you look at the five people around you and they will determine your own uh, happiness in an organization? If, if you got five negative nillies, then your chances are your environment's going to be negative. Yeah. Uh, there's a great book called Connected and there's mm-hmm. a great uh, article in the New York Times called Can Your Friend's Friend's Friend Make You Fat? And the mm-hmm. answer from the book and the article is yes, even if you mm-hmm. don't know that friend. And the point is 
that we are a function of the people around us. We are the average typically of even things as simple as like their height and their weight and their intelligence and their person and their uh, are they in, are they introverted or extroverted? And so it's very hard to grow and develop self-awareness. It's, it's extremely important and it's very difficult to do. But one mm-hmm. way you can do it on the road towards happiness is to simply ask yourself, hey, who am I spending time with? Who are the mm-hmm. five people I spend time with the most? I'm probably the average of those people. And mm-hmm. the science says you are, which is the same adage that says, you know, show me your calendar and I'll tell you your priorities. Mm-hmm. Don't tell me what your priorities are. Show me your calendar and then I'll tell you what your really what your real priorities are. I love so that. So similarly, yeah. exactly. And so the surrounding yourself, I think that's why people so many people like to surround themselves with you, Mark. Honestly, it's like <laughs> unbeatable, no, seriously, unbeatable mind. Accelerate your inner warrior. Guys, a Navy SEAL. Like they want to spend time with you. So right. so and I feel that way about podcasts I listen to. Mm-hmm. Right? Like I'm like, yeah. I'm I feel like I'm hanging out with the host. And mm-hmm. that becomes I meant for a while, like Honestly, if, if you asked me like two years ago, who was the top five people I was spending time with, I'd be like, number one, Tim Ferriss. I don't know Tim mm-hmm. Ferriss, but I was like, listen to his show every episode. So I was like, he mm-hmm. was one of the people in my head every day. You yeah, know? It doesn't and have to be a physical presence, you're saying. I agree with no, that. No, no, it doesn't. Because right? we're hanging out with the listener right now, mm-hmm. right? I have a podcast. It's called Three Books. I'm ha- I, always, I always set up a chair beside me and the guest just to remind me the whole time that I'm interviewing the person that there's someone else here. Mm-hmm. I love that. That's cool. I'm on a couch right now, so there's plenty of room for guests. <laughs> exactly. <visualizing> right now. <laughs> so what about the – I want to stick with this idea because you had these different tests. One of yeah. them was Saturday morning tests. Explain yes. that for us. And- sure. Um, a lot of people come up to me and when it comes to happiness, this is all the tests you're pulling are from one – so the book, The Happiness Equation is nine secrets. You're, you're pulling everything from this one secret, secret number eight, all about um, – uh, Authenticity, okay, which is one of the ingredients that I Got found it. in the research that really leads to happiness. One of those, of course, ingredients is okay. self-awareness. So how do you develop the self-awareness and the authenticity? One of the tests is the five people test. The other test is the 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 the, the, the Saturday morning test, okay? Mm-hmm. And there's a third test we can talk about if you like. The Saturday sure. morning test is asking yourself one simple question, which is what do you do on a Saturday morning – Mm-hmm. When and if you have nothing to do, okay. Mm-hmm. So say you wake up it's Saturday morning, it's totally blank slate. Now, how do you occupy your time? Your natural tendency will reveal to you a whole bunch of interests that you may not know. Mm-hmm. People are like, "Well, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I don't know what job I want to be in. I don't know what I want my career." I'm like, "Well, what do you, what's what do you do on Saturday mornings?" And they're like, "Oh, I go to the gym, or I play mm-hmm. my guitar." And mm-hmm. then so you start brainstorming wildly from that, and you're like. Oh, I could be a personal trainer. I could start a supplements company. I could import ukuleles. I should start teaching guitar online on YouTube. Point is, <laughs> all those things come from the answer to that root question, which is mm-hmm. when you got no one pushing you, no advice, no one yelling in your ear, no parental pressure, no what your friends are doing, when all that stuff is completely removed, how do you genuinely enjoy spending your time? And that will reveal to you a whole world of brainstormed ideas that you can kind of get off mm. on because they resonate deeply with something you're naturally passionate about. Yeah, it's cool. I like that. And as we were, as you were talking, I was like fact checking that, like, what do I do on Saturday mornings? And I'm thinking, huh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty aligned because I wake up and I'd be a warrior, right? I do warrior stuff. I train and I do that every morning when I wake up. Saturday's no different. So, so the tagline – the fact that you run a podcast with the tagline "Accelerate Your Inner Warrior" is aligned with what you naturally like to right. do. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's not like you're into ballet. Anything. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> I, I hear you. You're like you're like basket weaving is my real thing. I don't. I, I should right. really get on that. Okay. Um, so, do you want me to tell you the third test, by the way, or no? Yeah, okay. the bench test for all decisions. Is that what it's it, called? I just exactly. got some notes here. From, all right, let's hear about that. So the third and final test is the bench test. This is on on the path to authenticity, and it is um, my friend Fred. When I was a kid, like he was way smarter than me and anyone I knew. And he got into like every Ivy League school. Okay, I'm in Canada. So like hardly anyone even applies. So he he got in. He's like got into Princeton, got into Harvard, got into Dartmouth. And so I'm like, Fred, like, wow, congratulations, man. Like, first of all, like, I guess I'll see you later. You know, like you're going to move to another country. But how are you going to decide where to go? And he told me, he's like, well, I 
I looked at all the books and all the rankings and stuff, but they just tell you like how many books are in the library and how new the gym is and how fancy the residence <laughs> is. He's like, actually, I realized that the price of renting a Jeep for a week is like $300. And this, the value of this decision is worth much more than $300. So he's like, I'm renting a Jeep for the week. He did it. He did it. He left. He goes away for a week. He goes to every campus. He drives down there. They're all, I guess, together, like driving wise. Yes. No Ivy League North schools in, in Arizona for some reason. I don't know why. Right. So he goes to all there. They're all in the Northeast. And he says, he comes home. I was like, Fred, what did you do? What did you do on your trip? Like, how did you figure out which school? He's like, Neil, I looked around on campus, walked around until I found a bench somewhere situated, somewhere deeply in the middle of campus. Mm -hmm. I then sat on that bench for one hour in total silence, patiently observing and listening to what was around me. The, the snippets of conversation, how people were talking to each other, what they were talking about. And I asked myself deeply in my heart, does this connect with me? Considering that, yeah, I'll have 10% of my time in class, but you know, 90% of my waking hours are just going to be in conversations like this mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. classmates and, 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 and over meals and social events and stuff. So he's like, I picked the school which connected with me the most based on the bench test. And I was like, well, which school? And he ended up going to Princeton. And of course, as you can imagine, met his wife and all his best friends. And it's like, he's mm -hmm. like a devout alumni. And I thought, well, that's fascinating because when you go it on is. a job interview, and I was in, at least as we talked about, I was in human resources in Walmart. But you go on a job interview, no one ever asked me, oh, can I take a tour of the office? But if you mm -hmm. ask in that question in the, in the, at the end of your job interview, say, oh, can I have like a two minute tour of the office? They'll always say yes. And mm -hmm. if you do that tour, Guess what? You see how people talk, how they walk, mm -hmm. what's on the walls, how do they interact with each other? Are they polite? Are they do they smile or do they not? And you mm -hmm. get a bench test. If you want to buy a house, walk on this walk around on the sidewalks. If you want to buy a car, test drive the damn thing, right? It's like about putting yourself in testing situations. And the reason I came up with this test for the book is because a lot of my friends are lawyers and all my friends that are lawyers hate it. Like they're like, "I don't know why I became a lawyer." I blah blah blah. And I'm like, "Didn't you, <laughs> didn't you ever like go to a law firm like for one right. day and like even just sit there or like file a, do some free filing. They're like, never thought of that. So I'm like, mm -hmm. before you decide to devote, devote your entire life to like, for example, a thing or a profession or a person or whatever, do the bench test, give yourself a small version of it to see if you like it. I love that. You know, this brings up, I was talking to Jeff before uh, you came on, you know, just my uh, tech mm -hmm. producer and he was mentioning um, a blog he had just read or an article he just read about how the we're heading into the experience economy and how millennials are gravitating toward experiences versus material things because the obviously experience has a lasting impact and has emotional you know, energy to it. And they'd much rather spend money on an experience and it'll make them happy and they'll remember the, the good parts of the experience and not the bad and, you know, then, then let's say on a new toy. And, um, your bench test really is speaking to that, you know, to, to experience something before you buy it or before you make a big decision like that, as opposed to just, you know, accepting the marketing blurb or the material or just, you know, buying it like a product or like another thing that you're going to get into. That's powerful. You know, It totally is. And, and it makes sense for so many reasons. And one of the reasons I think that I don't know if it was mentioned in the article Jeff read or not, but it's because it used to be that stuff was scarce and experiences were plentiful. Right. Or at least the experiences you were aware of. You didn't know you could like, you know, um, skydive in New Zealand when you were like in the 1800s in, in upstate New York. So like you just didn't right. think about it. But the stuff. Well, and the pra practically speaking to pull that yeah. off was, was really hard. Yeah, we're going to take probably... an ocean line for three months. <laughs> exactly. I know. So, so that's the thing. So, so now it's the opposite where stuff – is abundant and experiences are scarce. A good example yeah. is speech. We already mentioned speeches. Why do people like you and me give speeches when our content is free? Like mm -hmm. you go on YouTube, you can watch my TED talk. You go, you right. can watch my Google talk. You can watch hours of my YouTube videos. You can, I'm saying if you just want to watch me, there it is. It's all there and it's free. But mm -hmm. the reason the, speech is valuable is because it is ensconced within a live event that is rare. The idea mm -hmm. of going to TED or to Summit or to like 
the once a year conference that your industry has that brings in Malcolm Gladwell and Brené Brown mm-hmm, and these people mm-hmm. and then there's you know Pastor Reach in some side room <laughs> you know for mm-hmm. t- but my point is that's the point the experience has now become the rare thing so of course it has the most social equity right that's cool i mean i've been in the experience business since we launched seal fit and people come to experience essentially navy seal training uh, not knowing that we're going to transform them in the process you know and they leave changed it's very cool but you're right. They could watch it on TV. Well, the good news is it's going to be a long time before the robots can do that. <laughs> sure, that you're safe. Thankfully. You and physiotherapists job, job are safe. security. That's right. Exactly. So, what are some? You mentioned there were other secrets that you allude to in the happiness uh, book. What What are some of the other most you know potent ones that would resonate to a listener? Let's say. Sure. Let's well, like, let me zoom up a level. Um, and this sure. is this is in the book as well. But but here's the thing about happiness. Um, if you go to Google right now and you type in how to be, you know how it suggests stuff? Like it tells you what everyone else is typing in? Well, mm-hmm. guess what the first drop down is? It's happy. happy. That's right. We want it more than anything else. And by the way, numbers two, three, and four are rich, pretty, and real estate agent. <laughs> I, that last one really got me. I wasn't not expecting that. So we want happiness more than anything. I'll start there. Now the next question you probably ask yourself is, "Oh, Neil, you just went on a big rant about how it's the area of abundance. It's the age of abundance. Mm-hmm. Are we happy?" And it's true. It is the age of abundance. We have never lived longer. We've never mm-hmm. had higher literacy and education rates and post secondary education rates. We have never been richer, even on relative terms. We've never been. We've never had more money, just just in terms of disposable income. We've we've also never um, uh, been able to travel as far, uh, uh, see as much stuff. Like nothing has. There's never been a more abundant time ever in human civilization. You could right. eat food from anywhere in the world outside your house any like time like, you know it goes on and on yet we are no happier now than we were mm-hmm. in the 1950s and this is research from university of michigan professor david meyer has been studying it for a long time it's like no we're just as happy now as we were 70 years ago even though apparently everything's improved and in fact when you look closer at the data some things you could argue like anxiety loneliness depression mm-hmm. suicide mm-hmm. these things are actually going up Right. Right. So then you're like, okay, wait a minute. Just quick summary. We want it more than anything else. We don't have it yet. Why not? Whose fault is it? And the, the person whose fault it is, is, is your mom and your dad, <laughs> your mom and your dad is your parents' fault. Of course. Um, <laughs> it's of course, it's your parents' fault. And it's not their fault. It's their parents' fault. It's not their fault. It's their parents' fault. And if you're a parent, it's kind of your fault too. Because what do you tell your kids? You tell your kids, oh, if you do great work, then you'll have a big success and then you'll be happy. So come on, we want you to get into a good school. Come on, we want you to get a good job. Come on, if you study really hard, that's the great work. Then you'll get good grades. That's the big success. And then you'll be happy, which is in Indian parlance, becoming a doctor, right? Mm-hmm. I'm Indian. My parents are my, – my mom's from uh, East Africa. My dad's from India. Mm-hmm. Or if you work really hard, you get a promotion or you make more money and then you're happy. We tell our kids this. The problem is that model is totally backwards. After reviewing all the kind of positive psychology literature, I can tell you it's – it's not just backwards. It's like fundamentally reverse. So mm-hmm. the root secret, as you asked me, on happiness is reverse that model. It's mm-hmm. learn how to be happy first. I mean, when you wake up in the morning and you're alive for your thousand minutes of the day, which is how many minutes you're awake for every day, and you're alive for your thousand months on this planet, which is the average lifespan right now, which is a thousand months, you got – I'm saying if you can prime your brain for positivity in the morning – you can put 20 minutes into you, then for the other 98% of the day, the other 980 minutes, you're going to be disproportionately happier. And we know that the big success comes there. You're more productive. You're more creative. You're more likely to get a promotion. People like spending more time with you. You live longer. You live lo- You live an average of 10 years longer, according to the Nun mm. study. So it's like mm. the fundamental secret on happiness is reversing the model that your parents taught you. That is that great work leads to big success, leads to be happy. No, it's being happy leads to great work, which leads to the big success. A mm. couple of thoughts. Uh, first, were the nuns, uh, did they live longer or shorter? I'm curious. Were they happy or unhappy? Yeah, this is the <laughs> famous study. I could go either way with that one. <laughs> yeah, well, the, there's a bunch of researchers at, down at the University of Kentucky who, who realized something 
they're way smarter than me. So they're like, oh, nuns. They're like perfect lab rats. They like, they're all the same gender. <laughs> they wear the same right. clothes. They eat the same food. None of them smoke or drink or have sex ever. Okay. Mm-hmm. Although sometimes if I say that to like an audience, people are like, not the nuns I know. So, <laughs> exactly. Like, so they say. Yeah. So they say, uh, haven't you seen Sister Act? No, I'm just kidding. But the point is, <laughs> um, they looked at these nuns and they looked at all the ones that joined convents in like the 1930s. Okay. And they looked at the autobiographies that they wrote before they joined. And if they used mm. one of th- three key phrases, the three key phrases were looking forward, eager joy, and blessed life. That's six words mm. total, but one of those three words. So I'm looking forward to joining the convent. I went to Notre Dame. I had a blessed life. If you use one of those three key phrases, they called you happy. They called you a happy nun. And the other kind of 75% or more were just sort of like normal nuns. Well, mm-hmm. because the research was done recently – they could find out what happened to the nuns. Mm. And they found out that the ones that entered the convent happier with that positive state of mind lived an average of 10 years longer. They found that mm-hmm. the average group, and this still applies today, in an, in an average group, 15% of us will live to the age of 94. But mm-hmm. if you're happy, then you more than triple your chances of making it that long. Whenever they do these interviews with like 100-year-olds, you've probably seen a bunch of them. It's like, I just mind my own business. I like – I think every day is a gift. Like these are like yeah. the – it sounds totally. overly <laughs> simplistic. You're like, oh, well, that person like must work for Hallmark or something. But no, right. when you are genuinely happy, when you can train your brain to be that way, when you can put yourself and you can flick that switch in the morning or the night, even though we all live the same life of pain and struggle and challenge and breakups and people cutting you off in traffic and telemarketers ringing your doorbell. I know. I live the same life. I'm not happy all the time, but I just know that it's a thing that – it's a muscle that we can work. And if we work that muscle, it has massive dividends. Yeah. You know, I I think this is a good time to like – talk about semantics because it is very easy to get trapped in language and and the deficiencies of language, right? So let's define the characteristics of happy because you just said something really uh, profound. Just because you consider yourself happy doesn't mean you're not going to struggle. And and it doesn't mean that you're not going to have moments of complete misery. And you can be in misery and still consider yourself a happy human being with a positive outlook knowing that this too shall pass, right? And looking forward to the future and all that. So really it is a, it's a, it's not just a word, it's a set of characteristics and, and it's a mindset and an attitude toward life, right? So what does that look like to you? Well, that, I think it totally, I agree completely. And I think it, this totally applies to your work, um, or because, right. because right. a lot of people, I, I use the same definition that a lot of folks uh, in this kind of world, uh, in, in this world of research and writing would use, which is it's the joy you feel while striving towards your potential. Mm-hmm. And so you can teach me about the Navy Zeal stuff, but I would tell you, like, you know, if a woman gives birth, that's incredibly painful, but she's mm-hmm. happy. Or if mm-hmm. a guy's running a marathon and he's getting shin splints and it's, you know, it's freezing outside and like, you know, he's about to collapse, but how does he feel at the end of the thing? Like he's, he's overjoyed. So mm-hmm. you can, building a deck in the summer with your bare hands, like you can feel happy even when you're going through something that's challenging. Mm hmm. So is happiness the same as contentedness? So in the happiness equation, the way I define it, the subtitle of the book, by the way, is want nothing plus Mm -hmm. do anything equals have everything. And so I define those things as want nothing is contentment, do anything is freedom, and then have everything is happiness. So it's contentment. I, I define it as contentment plus freedom equals happiness. And then... We can go into the detail of that, but but wanting nothing, and there's a lot of philosophy around this as well. Right, um, right. That is a huge. You get that a lot of people are like they st- like right away they're like I disagree with your book because like I want I want lots of stuff and that's good, mm-hmm. and I'm like oh I, I say oh you're American no I'm just kidding I say I'm just kidding I'm Canadian so that's that's <laughs> a common Canadian no, that's joke good. we um, tell Canadian and- jokes too so. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You have a lot more because you have a lot more. You have a lot more people. But, but I, 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 I sort of say, okay, okay, I get you. But, but actually, yeah. If you can do what you just said, Mark. If you can actually earn your way forward towards this idea that you don't really need anything, you know, you can. You, it's, it's about minimalism. It's about, it's about simplification. It's about the paradox of choice and and simplifying your decision making. It's about having less decisions to make. It's about lowering your access points. Everyone these days, the average person has seven access points. Do you realize that? 
People can Facebook message you and they can text you and they can. McKinsey says 31% of your day is bookmarking, prioritizing, and switching between tasks. So a mm. lot of what I'm preaching here on contentment is actually just like getting rid of things like social media yeah. and things that are right. like completely swallowing up our dopamine centers and just like pulling us away from happiness. The geniuses behind Qualia, the Neurohacker Collective, continue to impress me. I've been a big fan of their original Qualia formula for over a year, and now I'm stoked about their new product, Qualia Mind, which I've been using for a month. Qualia Mind is the most comprehensive mental nutrition product on the market today. It's packed with over 28 premium brain nutrients, and it's all natural and designed to boost your focus, your clarity, and mental energy. It works within just 30 minutes of taking it, and a recent pilot study showed improvement in six different cognitive areas after just five days of use. There's really too much to say about it. I can't you know, take the time here, but if you go to their website at neurohacker.com, that's N-E-U-R-O-H-A-C-K-E-R.com, you can read more about Qualia Mind as well as about their new product, Qualia Focus, and the pilot studies and all the other information. they got a ton of great stuff at their website. What I love also is these guys really, really believe in this product. They use it themselves and they offer a 100-day money-back guarantee, virtually no risk to you. And they've given you, Unbeal Mind listeners, a 15% discount if you use the code UNBEATABLE at checkout. So go to neurohacker.com, learn about Qualia Mind or any of the other products, use the discount code UNBEATABLE, and bring your mental A-game to every project, every goal, every day of your life. Hoo-yah, divine out. You know, this. I'm, I'm a little bit stuck. I'm not uh, disagreeing or arguing with you. Um, Please feel idea. free to disagree, though. What, what, tell <laughs> me more. Well, this idea of wanting, I, I do think that there's relevance for wanting things, but the question is to want the right things and to differentiate wanting from desiring. So I have the sense that, you know, when it comes to like material things or gravitating or being drawn toward things that aren't, that distract us, you know, like you just referenced social media, social media is very distracting. It's more tapping into our desires, which then, you know, constantly feeding that desire is what causes the addictive, you know, tendencies toward constantly checking your, your social media and whatnot. Whereas you can want to be whole as a human being to be grounded and to be happy. And so therefore that want is coming from your higher self and it's going to override the desire, which is kind of coming from your lower self. And so wanting the right things actually leads to discipline. And like my friend Jocko said, discipline then leads to freedom where you can do anything because you, you're, you're wanting the right things, which is overriding the desires, which is being moving toward the wrong things. Yeah, I, I totally I think that's right. And and I think the way I think about it is it's it's very related. It's just, it's about I- extrinsic and intrinsic motivators. Okay. So right. we so know from the re- extrinsic for the want. That's what exactly. Thinking. Exactly. So yeah. you you mentioned social media. It's like I when I when my blog so I started a thousand awesome things dot com ten years ago. And I was really smart at the beginning. I was like, no ads. I don't want any I want to just write because I want to write. But of course, guess what happened? Yeah. I became obsessed with like the hit counter. I'm like, oh, there's this <laughs> number on the side. I, I gotta get ratchet that up and and then the then i was like oh i need fifty thousand hits and then i was like oh well i got that pretty easily i i need to like get a million and i was like oh mm-hmm. that that means that doesn't mean anything i need a i need a book deal and i was like well that doesn't mean anything. i need to be a bestseller the book was a bestseller i'm not kidding the first week was number two and awesome. i was like oh i looked at the side of the bestseller list i'm like it says weeks on list like how many weeks has it been a bestseller well, my week my book has only been a bestseller for one week every other book was like two weeks five weeks 10 weeks i'm like mine's a one hit wonder so then my books on the bestseller list for like 100 weeks in a row i'm not kidding so i'm like oh my gosh and then i'm like and it, it never ended and the point is i'm like oh my gosh i got pulled away I wanted all those things. I wanted it to be bigger. I wanted it to sell a million copies. I wanted to get blah, 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 blah. I want my TED Talk to have lots of hits, blah, 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 blah. But I totally, and this is getting back to you and Jocko's point, it, I totally was pulling myself away from the root intrinsic motivator to begin with, which is yeah. I want to write an awesome thing every day to cheer myself up. And right. um, You stick with that. The rest will follow. And if you do it with authenticity and integrity, and or enough will follow. <laughs> exactly. And, and this is proven by research. This is a really famous study done. Um, Teresa Emma Bile uh, at Brandeis University has done a lot of studies on this. One of the famous ones is she had 
two sets of girls, like like young girls, teach even younger girls how to play the piano. So one mm-hmm. of the sets of girls was given like, you know, you get spend half an hour teaching the young girls piano, it's like eleven year olds teaching like six year olds or something. And at the end, you know, they'll say thank you. You'll make a meaningful difference in their life. And mm-hmm. the other set of girls was told, once you complete your half an hour of training, um, as the teacher, you get a, a free ticket to the movies. Okay. <laughs> And then she tested the groups before and after the teacher and the student. And you mo- won't be surprised to hear, Mark, that the ones that were only intrinsically motivated, like, again, they didn't get any payment. They got no nothing. They got, they were just told you got thank you. Guess what happened? They were more patient. They stayed mm-hmm. longer. The people mm-hmm. reported a greater sense of learning. Mm-hmm. And the ones that were given the movie ticket were like, they were quick to leave as soon as the half an hour was over. They were mm-hmm. shorter in their temper. They were like more frustrated easily because they were doing it for a reason mm-hmm. that they could attach themselves to. And this is actually proven by neuroscience as well. Truly what happens in our brains is when we're given the shiny object of the number of Instagram likes we get on a photo or whatever that is, we cannot see our intrinsic motivator anymore. It actually mm-hmm. – in our brains from a neuroscience level, we – because we are distracted by the shiny number. And this is why, mm-hmm. you know, the, the social media companies have like figured out that the thing we're actually addicted to on social media is the fact that we don't know how many likes it will get. We don't know if it'll be two likes or 150. That's the thing that we're addicted to. It's, <laughs> it's, um, there's a really That's famous test where they had like, um, rats like press levers to get food pellets. And if you don't know how mm-hmm. many food pellets are coming out, you can't stop pressing the button. If you know that it's mm-hmm. always going to be one food pellet, you stop pressing it. But when it's zero zero fifty, three two twenty nine, then you can't stop pressing because you don't know how many it's tricks like gam- you're gonna get. Gambling, exactly. Right? It's is that's exactly what it is. That's why cell phones. Essentially, if you look at a cell phone in front of your face, okay, your iPhone screen, and you compare it to like walking into Caesar's Palace, they look the right. same. They're all bright, shiny <laughs> colors flying in that are totally addicted. Right. The only thing is now the slot machines in your pocket. Right, with icons popping up and sometimes it's, you know, lots of shiny things and sometimes it's zero. Most of the time it's zero. It's totally you know, by design. This has huge implications for designing work and 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 life in the workplace, you know, in terms of incentive and, you know, compensation and setting up the workplace for intrinsic motivation and growth as opposed to competition and, you know, earning incentive, you know, incentivized with money and shiny things, you know? So anyways, I, I think that's more of a statement. This is probably, a, it's a fact. Let's talk about happiness at work. You know, what, what do you think about well, that? This is, what, what, what else can you do to improve intrinsic happiness? At well, work? to your point, there's a really famous Harvard Business Review uh, article written by Mintzberg. I think I'm getting the name right, called, um, uh, and maybe we can throw it in your kind of like your, your post or whatever. Um, right. It's called like kind of like why do people work? And, and it says that there's a bunch of hygiene needs and money is one of them. So you, you hit right. a minimum base threshold. And there's a famous Woodrow Wilson study done at Princeton. It's like, eh, if you make $70,000, you kind of hit it, right? Maybe that's eighty or 90000 in today's mm-hmm. currency. Point is, people don't work for money. They don't. They work to make right. a minimum amount that helps them meet their right. needs. But beyond that, they're working because they need to love the high-level purpose of the organization. They have to mm-hmm. personally connect with what they're doing. It has to be something purposeful, right? Mm-hmm. So if you get off on organizing the world's information, you might like working at Google. If you don't really care about selling ads to everyone who has eyeballs, you might not like working at Google. But how mm-hmm. do you see mm-hmm. what do you see the mission as? How do they articulate mm-hmm. it? What do they talk about it inside? And can you connect and identify with that? So mm-hmm. um that's, I think your point is really valid. We we need to motivate with intrinsic motivators, but it's very hard to do in organizations when you're paying people. So how do you, so that's mm-hmm. why you have to hit right. people's minimum and then you have to go, talk about belief systems all the way. Yeah, I agree. Now you talk, uh, we got to wind down here. We've already been at this for 45 minutes. Holy cow, I just noticed that. That's a good sign that you have no idea and, what time and it is. And it's one o'clock at your time, which means you got to go soon. So why don't we, what, real quickly, can I ask you one more question? Yeah. Have time for that. Work, we spend so much time at work. How can an individual improve their happiness at work? Beyond, beyond align, aligning with purpose. I get that one. Yeah, we know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Gallup reports that, and then the stat comes out every year, but it's always dismal and depressing. It's something like 11% of, of work for workers around the world are engaged in their jobs. Mm-hmm, it's right. like something terrible. Um, it is terrible. Yeah. And, uh, and so 
here's the thing. We know how to be happy. We do. We have the research. There's there's been three hundred there's been more than three hundred studies done in positive psychology since Martin Seligman and Michal Chekmihaly kind of invented that whole area of research in mm-hmm. nineteen in the late nineteen nineties. So we know what those things are. We know what they are. They are things like taking a nature walk for twenty minutes in the day. They are things like reading fiction, uh, reading fiction from a real book. Uh, they are things like journaling for twenty minutes, or or even less, mm-hmm. just journaling for five minutes about a couple of highlights from your day. They are doing something, mm-hmm. doing something small that's nice for somebody, like like writing an email to an old boss or a coworker, or mm. um, grabbing a coffee for for the person you work with, mm-hmm. right? So we know what those things are. We know what they are. But they aren't in the workforce design. And so mm-hmm. if you're a leader today or you're listening and you're thinking, well, I got a team of five people or 10 people, like, I, I, what do I do? Like it's about bringing those things. That's what my whole – that's what the whole institute I work – that I'm trying to create is all about. So it's globalhappiness.org. All I'm trying to do is give people tools that they can implement in the workforce. I've, I've even gone so far to actually put out – workshops they're totally free you just click a button and you download it it's like got the powerpoint slides it's got the like invitation and microsoft outlook everything and all it does is like literally give people the slides i use from a stage and say here you can you can just have them but all i beg of you is could you all just go for a walk at lunch together could you please do that because if you do your productivity in the afternoon goes way up or could you please start your day by just putting a calendar reminder at 9 a.m to send a nice note a three sentence email to, to one person about something that you want to thank them for like start your day with that three sentence email. If you do that, you will feel better all day. And and I and there's millions of these things, but we don't do them. Right. They're basic things. The the problem is at at work, optimists are closeted. The problem is that yeah. if you if you appear to be happy at work or if you appear to be like the kind of person that's has time to go to the gym at lunch, then the perception in most co- unfortunate corporate cultures it's not in every corporate culture there's healthy cultures out there too Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but the perception is oh that guy's got a lot of time on his hands well that person clearly either a doesn't have enough work or b isn't working hard enough Mm -hmm. and so we have stigmatized people who are actually valuing their happiness i'll tell you what though is the lady who who meditates at lunch will be the best employee on your team right right yes so it's incumbent upon leaders to set structure and culture where happiness is allowed <laughs> and encouraged and do it yourself so people and can see it by example exactly right. exactly because people always say what do i do my boss doesn't want to won't, won't let me i'm like well just go for the low-hanging fruit take the person with the dusty running shoes out for lunch and then soon everyone will join it's harder people's social signals really affect their behavior so if the boss is a team of five people all going for a 20-minute walk at lunch they will feel like a big like loser if they don't join because now you're like a Scrooge McDuck, you know, you got to, you got (laughs) to, social signals affect behavior change more than information or knowledge does. Right. I agree. Awesome. Well, we got to wrap here. You've got a new book coming out that you're, you're only publishing in an audible form. That's interesting. I'd love to talk to you about that, but maybe some other time. Um, It's called how to get back up, right? Around about failure, resiliency. Yeah. When does it, that come out? It it's just came out. That's an Audible original. And to answer your question, okay. it is also coming out as a print book from a big publisher. It just takes another year to like kill a bunch of trees and print on them, you know? So just the slower uh, to come so out that So you can way. get the Audible out yeah. quicker, huh? The Audible is out now. Uh, it's called How to Get Back Up, A Memoir of Failure and Resilience. Uh, it's okay. a story with a whole bunch of models like the like – the, uh, uh, big fish small pond one that we talked about at the mm-hmm. beginning on like what do you do to get back to your baseline because i hate self-help because to me the self-help category is like how do you get better how do you get more done how do you get your be- i, mm-hmm. I get i like all I, I understand that i'm in that i'm in that world mm-hmm. too but also it's like the reason i ever walk down that bookstore aisle is when i'm I, i'm sucking when i'm failing like yeah, when i yeah, when yeah, i need to get yeah. back to normal and so this is what the book is it's about a whole bunch of stuff you can do when you are finding that you are not at your best when you've suffered a loss a divorce lost a friend had to move changed a job lost a job gone through a challenge gone through a struggle got a de- terrible diagnosis or you know whatever it is this book is designed to help you get back up nice and um, how do folks find you? You got your podcast call, still called Three Books. What about a blog? Do you have you have your blog, or yeah. where, where would you like people to Neil kind of go blog. Re- reach out to? You? I, 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 so it's N E I L my name Neil at dot blog, B L O G, and that's got um, all my articles. I write articles on there. Um, if I ever publish an article, like on Harvard Business Review, or if I, was, I always just write it on my own blog too. So 
really mm-hmm. Neil.blog blog is kind of the center point for for me and for everything I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I love that. Awesome, Neil. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate everything you do. I look forward to meeting you in person someday. And um, I'm going to go buy your audio book as soon as I hang up. I can't wait to listen to it. And uh, yeah, be happy, my friend. Thanks so much for having me, Mark. Talk to you soon. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank Take you care. so much. Wow. All right, folks. So that's um, that was really, really interesting and extremely valuable. I encourage you to check Neil out at neil.blog. I didn't even know you could get a dot blog domain. I'm going to go look for divine.blog. That's kind of cool. Check out his new book, How to Get Back Up. And, you know, The Art of Happiness or The Happiness Equation, not The Art of Happiness. That's a different book. Good stuff. All right. As usual, you know what I'm going to say. Stay focused. Do the work every day and be unbeatable. And I can't wait to talk to you next time. hoo Divine out. You get home, boys. They got your back, the pride of the fleets, the bright swinging frogmen.